All right, time for the final test of Cerberus. Uh, we'll be testing the expansion uh, port protocol. Turn it on here. And there we have it. Um, I'm basically testing every signal um, in the expansion slot uh, with the Arduino Mega 2560. It has lots of digital pins, so I don't need to build any breadboard, anything. I can just connect uh, the Atmega pins here from the Arduino Mega straight um, to the expansion slot. There's only one exception to this. I I'm even powering um, the Arduino Mega uh, through these two cables here. I'm powering the Arduino Mega from the expansion slot as it's meant to be used. The only exception is uh, this, uh, let me see, over here. This is the clock, the expansion clock. Um, the Arduino Mega has its own onboard oscillator, so it doesn't need the clock. But to test it, I'm just hooking it up to the oscilloscope uh, to make sure that the clock is coming out correctly. So that's at uh, 8 megahertz. If I type slow, uh, I get 4 megahertz. And if I go back to fast, I get 8 megahertz. So that's working. Um, now I created a, a new BIOS command to test the expansion port. Predictably enough, it's called test exp. <laughs> Now, this will look very underwhelming when I run it, uh, but then I will explain to you everything that's happening there and why it tests uh, the expansion port. So if I click uh, uh, Enter to run, I just get an addition table. <laughs> no big deal, right? So why is this a test? The reason is the following. Um, the second operand here, uh, the second number, uh, it's determined um, by, by Cerberus. Cerberus also prints the left side of the equation and the equal sign. And then it sends the chosen first operand through the expansion slot to the Arduino Mega, which then calculates the result, sends it back to Cerberus, and only then the result is printed. So what you see there is exercising both input and output through the expansion slot. Now I'll tell you in more detail everything that's happening. So you see how uh, how much complexity, you now complexity may be a big word, but um, how much structure there is in this. Um, the test is being run here in the I/O controller, which is an AVR uh, I/O processor or an AVR microcontroller. It's the one that prints things on the screen. It also chooses the second operand, and then it puts that chosen operand on top of high memory, this chip. Then it will, uh, um, once that operand goes in there, the address is such that Spacer, which is the glue logic chip here, once it sees that something has been written into that address, it will pull down a strobe called expansion select. That strobe will come through one of these uh, pin, one of these pins here into the Arduino Mega, and that's the sign for the Arduino Mega that there is a message waiting for it here in high memory. And that strobe is calculated um, autonomously by Spacer based on which address has been used and whether that address is coming coupled with the right uh, uh, cycle. If so, it strokes the Arduino Mega, and then the Arduino will pull down a line telling FatCat, the I.O. Proce processor, that it wants the buses. Once uh, uh, FatCat receives that, that line, uh, it will pause the CPU. If one of the CPUs is running, it will pause the CPU, and it will send an, an acknowledgement signal again via the expansion slot to another pin of the Arduino Mega, the Arduino Mega would then pull down the uh, bus enable line that controls this interface chips here and therefore gain access to the internal buses uh, of Cerberus. It would then do a read operation to that key address in high memory and through the bus again, it will uh, read in the value. Then it will tell CAT, okay, I am done using the buses. Uh, you can use the buses again. 
so cat will uh, uh, lift that signal that told uh, the expansion card that it could use the buses. And then the Arduino Mega will calculate the sum, the one plus uh, that operand, and then it will again request from FatCat access to the bus. FatCat will acknowledge that. And then uh, um, the Arduino Mega uh, will write the result operand through the expansion slot into the same address in high memory. Then it will release the buses. FatCat will acknowledge that. And then it will pull down an interrupt line, an interrupt strobe, uh, uh, strobe telling FatCat, okay, I'm done, there is something in memory waiting for you, so that FatCat or one of the CPUs, if one of the CPUs is running, can go to memory and get the value that was put in there by the expansion slot. And that is then what is printed on the other side of the equation here. So all of this is happening uh, if I just type expansion test. Now I can show you how much happens if I run it again with the serial monitor open that corresponds to the sketch running here uh, on the Arduino Mega, if I, if I run the test again and we watch the serial monitor, you see everything that's actually happening. If we go back to the beginning, um, it shows when there is an interrupt, uh, all the functions that are being called, all the signals that are being manipulated, and, uh, and this level of debugging verbosity uh, allowed me to check that uh, everything is indeed working in all um, its details. Now, I talked about an interrupt, uh, and, and that's important because um, we cannot operate this entire protocol um, based on polling alone. Um, it, the, the timing just wouldn't work out well, so we need to assign interrupts to some pins uh, one of the pins of the expansion card, or the Arduino Mega playing the role of an expansion card, is connected to the expan expansion select line, which is generated by fat spacer if that address in high memory uh, is written to. Uh, but the I.O. controller of Cerberus, uh, FatCat, uh, also has a interrupt assigned uh, to the expansion IRQ uh, line. And that's the way the expansion tells the I.O. controller that it has left something in memory meant either for the I.O. controller or one of the two CPUs. So the CPUs and the I.O. controller don't have to keep polling. They can go merrily ahead and do other things. And once they are, they receive that interrupt, uh, expansion interrupt or XIRQ from the expansion card, which is managed by um, the, the AVR uh, I.O. controller, then they will uh, uh, look into memory and see what is there waiting for them. But uh, beyond that, they don't need to pull for these fast uh, signals. Uh, the interrupt does it. I can, in fact, show you um, the interrupt routine. Um, so th this is the sketch that is running uh, on the I.O. controller. So I basically assign an interrupt to pin 22, which I believe is A26 uh, of the AVR controller. Uh, I assign an interrupt to that pin, and the interrupt function or the interrupt service uh, routine is over here. And all it does is if one of the CPUs is running, then it will pull down uh, the CPU IRQ line that goes from the AVR controller to Spacer and Spacer will translate that into the appropriate interrupt signals for either the 6502 or the Z80. Now, one of the important things about this is that uh, Cerberus is made to operate uh, asynchronously. So every subsystem of Cerberus operates asynchronously with respect to the others. For instance, uh, these are the video and character memories. On top of them, that's the video circuitry with two CPLDs they have even their own oscillator over here, which is different from the oscillator that runs in the computer proper, which is this lower part here. So we can imagine the computer proper as this lower part here, plus the two memories. These are the video and character memory, and then on top you have the video. The video circuit and the computer proper are asynchronous. Not only that, the CPUs 
and the I.O. controller operate asynchronously with respect to one another, even though they all get their clock clocks ultimately from the same oscillator, so they're more or less phase-locked. Uh, but that's, that's circumstantial. It's not something I make use of. Um, they might as well operate in completely different crystals because their function is asynchronous with respect to one another. They obey a generalized protocol that does not require synchronization. And the same thing, same thing applies to the expansion slot. As you see, I am not even using the clock signal, which is going to the oscilloscope. It's not going to the Arduino Mega. Um, so uh, the protocol for uh, using the expansion slot is such that whatever you do on the expansion slot can be completely asynchronous. You can run your own crystal in your, exp in your expansion card, just like the Arduino Mega uses its, its own oscillator over here. Um, uh, and it would, everything would work because the protocol is generic. It's agnostic of uh, uh, phase relationships or frequency relationships between the clocks. Um, it's even agnostic of what CPU you are running. The whole thing is extremely generic. Uh, there is an abstraction layer on top of the actual hardware that allows you to just, if you want, for instance, to change the video circuitry, these are two highly programmable CPLDs with the, the deterministic timing. You don't need to worry about timing, closure, and all that crap that you get with FPGAs. You can change the video circuit here without worrying about timing or synchronization because it's totally asynchronous with the rest. And the timing model is set by the very architecture of the CPLD, so you don't need to worry about time enclosure. Um, so you have this kind of uh, generic way of changing the architecture. A uh, uh, fat spacer here is the, is the glue logic for, for the entire system. Um, you can change the logic here without worrying about synchronizing with the video circuit, circuitry which in the old architectures wasn't the case. You know, the video circuitry was totally synchronized with the computer proper in order to coordinate access to video and character memory. Well, here you don't have that. These are dual ported memories, two asynchronous clock domains. So you can change this without worrying at all about that or without worrying about whatever expansion card you put in there. And by the same token, you can design your expansion card without having to worry about you know, what is actually happening here because it's asynchronous and completely um, independent. So this is it. The whole thing is now tested. Uh, it's ready to go. Let me reset the system. Um, server is this software reset, which is one, on a, one of the advantages. There isn't even a, a reset uh, button. Uh, you reset it from uh, the keyboard and if one of the CPUs crashes because of some wrong programming, uh, the I.O. controller still runs independently. And so does the expansion card. They all can run independently. So you don't need really a reset bit. And it doesn't even have a power supervisor. Well, not an explicit separate one because I'm activating the brownout mode of uh, the I.O. controller. So when it senses that the voltage has gone below 4.8 volts, it will reset everything the I.O. controller resets, can, can reset the entire system. So when it browns out, the moment it comes back, the first thing it does is to reset everyone. So we don't even need an explicit you know, VCC uh, 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 monitor or a VCC supervisor chip uh, because it's built into the brownout mode uh, of the I.O. controller. Uh, that's why we don't have those kinds of buttons. Uh, the whole thing works as fairly asynchronous independent parts and blocks uh, which makes it very nice to experiment hardware wise you can change the hardware on the three cplds without worrying about time enclosure because these are cplds not fpgas you can change the bios running on the microcontroller this is this this io controller is just uh, Ardu Arduino programmable. You can program it from, from, from the Arduino IDE. And of course, you can design your own expansion cards, which are also asynchronous and independent of whatever CPU you are running, whatever uh, hardware is in here, whatever code is in there. Well, not completely independent. You, whatever is running here has to speak the same protocol, uh, but that's pretty high level. The details uh, don't really matter. So this is a kind of a, um, a sandbox for people who are into hardware experimentation. It is for hardware people 
what Agonlight is for software people. Agonlight exposes all the architecture to software people and they can change everything, including the video uh, coprocessor um, by programming in C. Um, uh, but here, you can change everything by writing uh, um, hardware descriptions for the CPLDs. And CPLD hardware descriptions are extremely easy. They are basically gate level schematics that you write down instead of drawing. So they're much easier to understand, much easier to see. Uh, the fact that everything is in three, three CPLDs makes the whole thing much more understandable and accessible than if, than if I had used, for instance, an FPGA or, or a 74 series logic. There was a YouTuber the other day, I forgot who it was, was claiming, oh, it's much more, e it's much easier to understand a, a, a computer made with 74 series logic as opposed to a CPLD. Well, <laughs> whoever that person was has no idea what he or she is talking about. That's complete bullshit. The reality is the opposite. CPLDs make it the easiest to understand uh, and to modify. And if you have the hardware description, uh, which in this case you all have, because it's an open source uh, computer. So this is it. Testing is done. Um, I'm, not, I'm now going to send some of the prototype units to developers, to, to my collaborators, my partners in crime. Um, and then there should be a GitHub release uh, later in the summer after they do their magic and the firmware is, you know, is decent and usable and we have basic interpreters for both the 6502 and the Z80 and the firmware running here is a little bit more stable and the whole thing is more sort of uh, um, stress tested um, and then everything will go on GitHub. So um, stay uh, in the loop, uh, look out for that. Things are developing quick and it's all very exciting. I'll see you next time, take care.